Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to today's webcast, Heartbleed Outpatient Care, Steps for Secure Business Recovery. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Coordinator here at Tripwire. Uh, before we start the webcast, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First of all, if you have any questions during the webcast, feel free to use the Questions tab on your console. We will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. We'll also be doing a couple quick polls, too, to be exact, during the presentation. So when you see those come up, uh, we'll introduce them, and when they come up, please vote, and we'll see how those results come along. Uh, thirdly, please rate the presentation. It really helps us uh, with your feedback, and that's uh, the ratings tab you'll see. Lastly, I will be sending out a link to the on-demand version of the webcast and a link to slides, as well as information um, for earning your CPE credit for attendance today. So without further ado, let's get on with the presentation. Uh, we have three presenters today, Ken Weston, Ed Smith, and Katherine Brocklehurst, all from Tripwire. Ken Weston will start us off today, so go ahead and take it away, Ken. Thank you, Kate. Hello, my name is Ken Weston, and uh, today I'll be presenting with my colleagues Ed Smith and Catherine Brocklehurst on a topic of rather historical proportions to the security and IT industry, uh, the Heartbleed Open SSL vulnerability. So here's our agenda today. Just so you know, we have calibrated our talk to cover the spectrum of audience attending today. We have existing Tripwire customers familiar with vulnerabilities and security, as well as business leaders, consumers, and other non-technical folks who are not familiar with Heartbleed. We'll be uh, having a, a few polling questions throughout, and we'll also have a Q&A towards the end. I think a good place to start is to, to um, just explain simply what Heartbleed is. Heartbleed is a, a vulnerability that affects OpenSSL, a popular free open source software package used to secure online communications. Roughly two-thirds of websites on the Internet have been affected as well as other devices and technologies, including OpenVPN. There are currently a number of active exploits targeting this vulnerability, proliferating and freely available online. Given the nature of this vulnerability, your network may already be compromised without you even knowing about it. To help explain the Heartbleed vulnerability, I'd like to use a great comic from xkcd.com, which illustrates it very well. When an SSL connection is made, a check-in by the client is initiated with the server to see if it's still listening. This is referred to as a heartbeat. The bug in OpenSSL occurs in a particular condition where the server is tricked into sending more information back than just the heartbeat, revealing a block of data in the server's memory. A hacker can easily deploy an exploit that continually downloads streams of data from the vulnerable systems that the data can include not only sensitive user information, such as usernames, passwords, social security, and credit card numbers, but also private server keys and credentials, leading to further compromise of the system and your network. Usually when we deal with a system compromise, it follows a, a more sophisticated path in what Lockheed Martin has termed the cyber kill chain. An attacker first conducts reconnaissance of their target, gathering information about the organization and network before they actually begin exploitation, command and control, and exfiltration of sensitive data. Here's a screenshot showing the result of a common hard bleed exploit that I have initiated against a sandbox system I have set up for testing. The data on the far right column shows data that is read out of memory this information can include sensitive information, essentially anything on the server itself. At this point, we could assume that the server has been compromised, particularly if private server keys or login credentials have been exposed. With the Heartbleed, with Heartbleed the process of requiring an attacker to follow a complex sequence of steps from exploitation, avoiding detection, and exfiltration becomes unnecessary. In fact, many of the reconnaissance or tools used to test for the vulnerability is actually an exploit itself, using compromised data return as an indicator of vulnerability. To make matters worse, as the data is extracted in memory, there is no evidence left behind, no logs, no indicator that any information has been exfiltrated. What makes this even more dangerous is the simplicity of executing the exploit and how widespread it now is. Anyone with limited amount of technical skill can find and utilize these exploits against you. We could go through and identify many of the popular websites and services that have been affected by the Heartbleed exploit. However, 
it might be easier to identify who hasn't. Many of us have received emails from websites and services we are using asking us to reset our passwords as a result of the Heartbleed vulnerability. The important thing to remember here is that these services and websites were not negligent. Many had top-of-the-line security tools deployed, followed best practices, and are still affected by the vulnerability, simply due, ironically enough, to selecting a common tool that's open source to help secure their systems. The vulnerability itself is the product of simple human error and not malicious intent. When the vulnerability was announced, the patch was made available, many services acted quickly. However, for many, it was not a simple task. In some cases, even the slightest delay resulted in user and critical network data being compromised. Even now, many websites and services still remain vulnerable. Many times you've heard the phrase in security, it's not a matter of if you've been breached, but when. I would like to add to that. It is also important to identify for how long you've been exposed, or simply being able to detect if you've been breached in the first place. The Enterprise Threat Gap is a model that helps us illustrate the amount of time that passes through three critical phases. The detection gap indicates the amount of time it takes to discover an actual compromise and identify its scope. The remediation gap indicates the time be between that detection and the amount of time it takes to limit the damage. Then we have the preventative gap, which is the measure of time it takes to avoid repeated or similar attacks. This process allows you to answer three key questions to the business. Have I been breached? How bad is it? And how can we avoid it from happening again? When it comes to the detection gap, Tripwire Log Center provides decreased mean time to resolution of security incidents, shortening the time to detect and act on these events. Today we release powerful correlation rules that maps to known heart bleed intrusion detection signatures to alert on exploit attempts in real time as well as provide in-depth security analytics and reporting on historical patterns and anomalies related to these exploit attempts. I would like to illustrate how these rules work in more detail. For example, if an exploit attempt is made against your network, the intrusion detection system can now identify the attack signature and pass this information to Tripwire Log Center. Tripwire Log Center can then initiate various actions, from sending alerts, opening a help desk ticket, to initiating scripts which may kick off a remediation process. In addition, reports can be quickly generated for sharing across the organization for more in-depth analysis of the exploit patterns. To take this a step further, given the widespread availability and use of Heartbleed exploits for active exploitation, as well as simply testing if systems are vulnerable, the number of intrusion detection alerts can become quite noisy, making it difficult for organizations to identify real threats. By leveraging the tight integration that Tripwire Log Center has with Tripwire's vulnerability management solution, IP360, we are able to correlate these exploit attempts with vulnerability information on that host. If an active exploit hits the host, we can see if that host is running a vulnerable version of OpenSSL. If it has already been patched or is not vulnerable, the exploit attempt may be reported on, but may not trigger an alert. However, if the exploit hits the system and it is vulnerable, we would want to trigger an alert or initiate other actions. So we're going to take a quick poll here. Um, let's see. So we want to identify if you have been affected by Heartbleed. So I'm going to start the audience voting here. So have you been affected by Heartbleed? So a is yes, we have been affected. B, no, we have not been affected. Or C, we do not know. So as you guys vote, um, to actually better understand how Tripwire IP360 identifies vulnerabilities related to Heartbleed and OpenSSL, I'm going to open it up here to um, Ed Smith. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. So I'd like to talk about how Tripwire IP360 can help close the prevention gap. And before we move on, we'll go ahead and close up the poll, and we'll advance to the next slide. With IP360 available from Tripwire, 
The solution automates vulnerability management and reporting using your business context and leveraging your existing security controls. And this allows you to know what's on your network and protect your organization from threats like the heartbeat, Heartbleed bug. And speaking of the Heartbleed bug, it's not actually a single bug. Heartbleed is actually a variety of bugs. And all these bugs can affect the popular OpenSSL crypto library that's used in a variety of applications, from web servers to email servers, applications, VPN clients, or potentially anywhere secure communications are required. So this is not just one vulnerability on a few servers. Heartbleed is a variety of vulnerabilities that can potentially live wherever SSL is used. So this means that Heartbleed is not just a vulnerability that affects the web servers on your network perimeter. Heartbleed exists, again, wherever there are vulnerable versions of OpenSSL. This may include servers on your internal networks that hackers could leverage use in an attack to move laterally across your network. So if you haven't done so already, the Council on Cybersecurity recommends taking inventory of all authorized and unauthorized software and hardware on your network. So if you're going to do anything to improve the security of your organization, those are the first two things that you need to do according to the Council on Cybersecurity. Now, once you have this list, you can identify what applications are installed on what devices, and that's going to help you track down this vulnerability or the next Heartbleed vulnerability that comes out. You're going to be able to find that very quickly, and ideally, you will have access to this information in a searchable database to quickly find those affected servers. So, where is OpenSSL on your network? A lot of the press and the news are talking about scanning your web servers on your perimeter networks. There's a lot of free tools that are available out there, but don't forget the email servers, the FTP servers that are on your perimeter. What's in your data center? What could be using OpenSSL as far as databases or application servers? As well as what's on your internal network. There could be operating systems, VPN clients that leverage the OpenSSL library, those may also be vulnerable as well. So again, this is not just an issue with systems exposed to the public internet. There may be vulnerable machines inside of your organization and data center that could be used to leverage an attack. So obviously we all know that we want to scan our perimeter networks, find those heartbleed bug bugs that are exposed to the public internet, but we also want to scan our internal networks as well. And this is where we can find any of those other machines, any of those other devices that are affected by the Heartbleed bug. And not only do we want to scan the outside and the inside of our network, we need to scan the inside and the outside of devices that may be affected. So a common vulnerability check is a remote check that looks for services that are exposed to the network that may be affected by the Heartbleed vulnerability. And so a remote check is a basic scan that checks software that is running and available on the local network. However, Heartbleed can affect software that's not currently running when the scan is run, or it can affect software that isn't exposed to the network but that still could be leveraged by a hacker during an attack. That's why it's important to also use local checks when looking for Heartbleed. These take a deeper scan, a deeper look into the system to find Heartbleed, even if the vulnerable application isn't running or if the vulnerable application is not exposed to the public network. The way these local checks work is that they use administrative credentials to scan deep into the system and look for instances of Heartbleed that are not visible to the network. Now, some of the test sites that are out there for checking for, for Heartbleed vulnerabilities on your perimeter, these are really great tools for scanning one machine at a time. Of course, in a larger network, you're going to want to automate that process. You don't want to go and scan each machine individually one by one. In a larger network, you're going to want to continually scan for vulnerabilities like Heartbleed so that you can reduce the prevention gap by responding quickly 
of disclosures like heart bleed. Automation can also help close the prevention gap by prioritizing results automatically based on your business context, based on the way that your organization is set up and your networks are set up in a way that helps you focus on reduce, reducing risk for your most critical assets. And so at this point, I'd like to put up a, th uh, a poll question as far as what have you been using to detect the Heartbleed vulnerability? Have you used a tool to detect Heartbleed? If so, was this a uh, one of those free online tools? Are you using a tool that your company owns? Maybe you've used both. You've used both the free online tool and a, and a, a tool that is implemented for your for your company. Or if not, we have an option for no. So we'll we'll give you a, a few minutes, or I should say a few seconds, to let the the results come in. Uh, and it's looking like uh, so far the the majority of you have not used a tool for heart bleed detection and uh, followed by a close second of those, those free online tools for detecting heart bleed. So that, that's interesting. It's looking like about a, a third of our audience has not yet used a tool to detect heart bleed. So I would like to introduce a, a tool that you can use um, to detect heart bleed in your environment. So if, if you're not a Tripwire Vulnerability Management customer um, and you'd like to detect heart bleed, we have a free vulnerability scanner called Tripwire Secure Scan. And this is a free tool that you can use to scan up to 100 IPs, up to four times a month, includes automated scanning. We can check your internal networks. We can do remote and local heart bleed checks. We can check your web servers, mail servers, and not just for heart bleed, but for over 50,000 vulnerabilities. And I know we have a lot of Tripwire IP3, excuse me, IP360 customers joining us today, and want to let our customers know we've been on the case since this information was disclosed. Last Wednesday, we released comprehensive heart bleed coverage barely a day after the news broke. If you are an IP360 customer, all you need to do is update to the latest ASPL and run your scans as usual. And we have the URL at the bottom of the screen there. So if for those of you, the, the third of our audience that haven't done any vulnerability scanning, visit tripwire.com forward slash secure scan and get the sign up information on there. And I'll just walk you through very quickly what's going to happen after you sign up for secure scan. Um, after logging into the site, we set up a scan profile. And with with Tripwire Secure Scout, this Secure Cloud, uh, excuse me, Secure Scan, it's a cloud-based solution. Now, while our flagship vulnerability management product, Tripwire IP360, that's a completely on-premise solution for vulnerability management. But with Tripwire Secure Scan, what we wanted to do is provide a tool um, that, that people could set up without any hardware, without any software, and get up and running very quickly. And so when you're setting up your Secure Scan account, you simply set up a secure connection through your browser. You can also specify those administrative credentials. So this is where we can do those deep scans, um, not just the remote checks, but also the local checks. So we can find all of those different variations of heart bleed and other vulnerabilities, uh, no matter where they might be hiding. You can schedule the scan to kick off immediately, or you can schedule a recurring scan up to four times a month. What's great about scheduling a recurring scan is that the next time a heart bleed-like vulnerability is disclosed, you'll already be ahead of the game on closing the prevention gap. So you can run the scan immediately by clicking the Run button. While the scan is running, there's no need to keep your browser open or you, know, you can use your computer as you, as you normally would. Just be sure to keep your computer turned on. After the scan completes, you can view your results in the dashboard or download the results as a PDF report. So with Secure Scan with Tripwire IP360, we're not just looking for, for heart bleed. We're going to find other vulnerabilities that may exist in your environment. Now, if you are interested in just heart bleed vulnerabilities, here's what you're going to want to look for in your Secure Scan report. 
Notice that we have both those remote checks, including the Heartbleed TLS. That's the main vulnerability that everyone's talking about, but also checks for the same vulnerability in other network services, as well as local checks for operating systems and for VPN clients. So again, these are all just the checks for Heartbleed that you can look for. So, if you find Heartbleed in your environment, obviously you're going to want to update OpenSSL or contact the vendor for a fix if you're dealing with an embedded version of OpenSSL. But also remember that if Heartbleed is found, that the certificates should be changed as a precaution. It's like if you went on vacation, someone broke in your house, stole your keys, made a copy of them, and, and returned them before you even noticed, if you were to find out about that, you would change the locks in your house. And it's the same, same scenario with Heartbleed. So to recap, how to close the prevention gap on Heartbleed and other potential breaches due to vulnerabilities like Heartbleed. Take inventory of devices and applications affected by the threat. And ideally, you already have that inventory in a form that you can search. And just because you ran a free, one of those free tools on the internet to check your website, check your perimeter, don't forget about the other machines besides your website. And don't forget about scanning your internal networks and data center anywhere where SSL may be used. Also make sure that you're scanning not only for vulnerabilities that are exposed on the local network, but as well as vulnerabilities in software and operating systems. And of course, I mentioned Tripwire Secure Scan can help protect against breaches from Heartbleed, Heartbleed and other vulnerabilities. Um, so Tripwire Secure Scan is up to is good for up to 100 IPs. If you need more coverage than 100 IPs, we offer Tripwire IP360. This can help you automate your vulnerability management program, automate the reporting, bring in the business context of how your organization and how your network is set up, and also leverage your existing security controls. So if you'd like to learn more about Tripwire IP360, I invite you to visit our website and request a demo. So we've talked a little bit about closing that prevention gap. And, how, and however, th this is just the first step. Merely finding out whether or not Heartbleed is in your environment, that's only one piece of the puzzle. Even if you follow these steps, you're not necessarily safe. So at this point, I'd like to hand it off to my colleague, Catherine, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about closing that gap. Oh, hi. Thank you, Ed. I was muted. You know, that's what happens. And um, I only have a few slides left for today, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about remediation because you may need to be able to answer not only the question of how bad it may be, but also based on that scope, what you have to do to fix it. And in the case of Heartbleed, the worst case scenario is that you've been compromised and don't know it, and maybe even have been compromised long before this vulnerability surfaced publicly. And this is because an attacker could, by now, have sensitive information and be masquerading as an authorized user. Okay. So how bad is it? We've just talked a little bit about that. And moving now to a recap of Ed's slide, which is so fun, but uh, let's say you've, you've taken good action. You got ahead of it. You've scanned. You've got your inventory of vulnerable systems, and you've applied the fixed version of OpenSSL, or maybe you've altered the parameter that they advise to change if you can't uh, upgrade. And I hate to say it, but you may still not be safe. And that's not just FUD. That's not just fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, for those of you that use our products, our customer portal has all of the example rules and settings that you can use with our products to catch issues that may surface after you've completed remediation. And in case you may have wondered about our name, this is the concept, and it's very much aligned with the way that attackers can exploit after they've work the Heartbleed vulnerability. You may have taken all those good actions, knocked it out everywhere you know of, but you may not know that evidence could surface for some time afterward. And we're just like an invisible laser tripwire. We can help you catch what may be going on inside even after you've done the remediation and fixed things in the possible case that someone has authorized access already. 
And of course, Tom got around the pressurized floor this way, but the point is that he had already breached the facility. And in the case of Tripwire Enterprise, we don't just have one laser, we have many. So when we, when we get past IP360 and the log center, and you're thinking about post heart bleed concerns and how to be safe, just know that there may be more than one thing for you to think about. You may still have this threat gap. Now is the time to be watching for change. In the security industry, we tend to watch for unauthorized change users or files that appear, and that has its place. In the case of the heartbeat bleed, we may actually have valid credentials, or someone may actually have valid credentials. And in fact, a huge, uh, almost 78% of last year's Verizon Data Breach Investigations report indicated that stolen, misused, or actually valid credentials were in play. Tripwire can catch that. A part of TE's solution watches for changes in files because it's a common pattern. For you, it's most helpful to know what changed, when it changed, and who changed it. Tripwire catches that. And a bonus is we offer the ability to remediate or to go back to a known or good baseline. And you can set exceptions. You can force enforce policy compliance, and you can get cut out unauthorized or an imposter set of changes as they happen and automatically get your system back. Ultimately, we can help you reduce the threat gap in the remediation timeline and shorten this timeline. These timelines are presented in equal tridents on this little stopwatch, but it, what if you could shorten that time to detect, shorten that time to remediate, and shorten that time in the end to protect? So let's just show you a quick example, and we're almost finished, about what Tripwire Enterprise, what TE might show as results. In this case, and this is from our research labs, about 25% of the environment had the heart bleed vulnerability. And again, it checks all types of systems, OSs, applications, databases, and hardware devices that you might have to show whether or not a vulnerable version of heart bleed is there. Instant knowledge. So in summary, with heart bleed, unlike many un vulnerabilities that we hear about publicly, you should, you can and should scan, and you can discover your inventory of hardware and software assets, how vulnerable you may be, but you can't just scan and be safe. You can't just receive log intelligence and alerts and actions from IDS or IPS devices either, and you can't only use a tool like TE to keep watch after you as well. What we've discovered is that after you've found and fixed everything, it really takes all three of these to get you into, safe, into the safe zone and vigilance, of course. So in closing, just in case with all this information, you got a little lost in all the product su suggestions that we had, if you have a scanner and it will scan and discover, then good for you. We have both IP360 and Secure Scan, and it will offer these features and help you pinpoint heart bleed. For the log center, you can receive input from other systems. You can intelligently alert and all the things that indicated right here. In TE, in enterprise, Tripwire Enterprise, it helps you to keep watchful. It automates your responses, and it can take you right back if you need to. And so the final slide really is just to offer you a few resources that you might find helpful. I might point out that the fourth, the third, um, I'm sorry about that, the fourth bullet down uh, is our recent um, blog post on checking for home routers because that's something we didn't directly discuss, but many of you who work from home or have home systems, you might want to take a look at that blog and see what abilities there might be for or guidance we offer. And for those of you who are customers, and Ed mentioned it as well, the fourth bullet or the fifth bullet down shows you that our customer portal has some helps for you, just stuff to download and take a look at for your own use. And in case you weren't aware of it, here's the OpenSSL, the CVE location at MITRE, and so forth. Hopefully, all these resources could be of some benefit to you as you're struggling or fighting against this uh, issue. And uh, we certainly appreciate you joining us for this little webinar. We hope it's been helpful. We know there's been an array of those of you with different, you know, skill levels. So hopefully we've been able to give some guidance. And I'm going to turn the Q&A session over to Ed at this time.
Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and just a note, we will be sending out uh, a link to this recording as well as the slides so that you can have that resources page that, that Catherine just reviewed. And so at this point, we'll go ahead and open up the Q&A session. Uh, we've already had a, a lot of questions come in. Uh, if you haven't already, feel free to submit your questions through the questions interface and the BrightTalk interface. And we'll go ahead and uh, open up the, the Q&A session here. Uh, so first question that comes in uh, that came in, can, can Heartbleed impact my internal servers behind my network firewall? And I, I think I saw this one come in a little bit earlier in the presentation before I got a chance to um, address this, but I'll just go ahead and do a quick r recap that, uh, you know, Heartbleed, it's not just a bug, it's multiple bugs. This could be anywhere in your network, not just on your network perimeter. So we'll go on to the next question. Uh, I'll pass this one over to Ken. Are, are network firewalls not effective in protecting me against Heartbleed type of bugs? Uh, good question. Actually, some uh, firewalls actually may be affected by um, the, the vulnerability itself because uh, some of them do utilize OpenSSL. Um, there's also some question as to if firewalls will actually be able to detect the exploit, and um, it really depends on the, the firewall itself. Some have IDS um, built into them, some don't. Um, so that's something that you're going to want to check with your vendor on to make sure that they've updated those signatures. Great. Thanks, Ken. Next question coming in, is SecureScan PCI compliant? In other words, is SecureScan an ASV? So the question here is, is SecureScan an authorized scanning vendor for the, uh, the payment card compliance industry specification? SecureScan is um, ac it's actually built on PureCloud, uh, which is an authorized scanning vendor. So with the, uh, with the SecureScan service, that's not an ASV. We, we do have a separate service that we can provide works in conjunction or uh, work, uh, works in conjunction with Tripwire IP360 um, for PCI compliance. So we do have a solution for ASV. It's not the Secure Scan solution. All right. So we'll open up the next question in the mix here. Uh, the general public is now aware of this exploit. But my understanding is that it's been around uh, for at least two years. Has, has Tripwire been able to detect it since its discovery two years ago or just recently? And uh, I'm going to pass this one over to Ken. Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, we, we deal with uh, vulnerabilities all the time. We have an entire research team, the, the VERT team, that focuses on this. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, the code was um, introduced for um, – about two years ago, however, it was just recently discovered. And it's when the, the patch comes out that um, hackers and uh, security researchers are then able to identify uh, that there is a vulnerability and they're able to write the exploit. So that's a, a really good question is the fact that, yeah, there's, there's this open SSL bug, but there's many other bugs and many other applications. Um, so, you know, this isn't the first uh, vulnerability and this will not be the last. Um, it just happens to be the biggest and most widespread we've seen so far. Yeah, that's that's a I think that's a good you know also a good point to make that you know it is a zero day vulnerability. Um, there may have been some malicious actors out there that were aware of it. You know, of course, our research team, um, you know, the re everyone's research teams weren't aware of it. However, th th it's not just about detecting the vulnerability. It's also about detecting suspicious activity. So using Tripwire Log Center. Um, even though we may not know this particular exploit, we notice suspicious things are happening on the network. And then also detecting change, detecting authorized and unauthorized change. So even though this vulnerability wasn't on the books, a solution like Tripwire Enterprise can monitor for those changes and alert to suspicious activity. So I think that's, that's a really, really interesting question. So, you know, even though it's a, it's a zero day, doesn't mean that there's no protection for you. So we'll move on to the next question. Uh, what is a remote check? And I think this, this goes back to the, the, the discussion on closing that prevention check when I was talking about um, doing a remote check versus a local check. It really just has to do with, with the depth of, of a scan. Um, you know, think about going to the doctor. You know, they check your pulse. They take your temperature. That's kind of a remote check. Um, a... Uh, a local check would be more of a, you know, exploratory surgery, although not as traumatic, by being able to look deep inside, you know, 
what's going on on the inside. So the idea here is that you want to find Heartbleed, you know, even if it's not running on the network in a place that you can, you can see it on the local network. So we'll move on to the next question. I'm a uh, small office home office user. Will your products work for me, or do I need an IT expert to manage and monitor? With Tripwire Secure Scan, we've designed the solution to be easy for anyone to use. You don't need a, an IT certification, uh, you know, or a, a, a PhD in information technology. Uh, it's designed for anyone to log in, set up a scan. Uh, I know a lot of us here at Tripwire have. Um, you know, we've even recommended this to our, our, our friends and family as a way for them to help pr protect their networks. So we'll move on to the uh, next question here. So uh, this is Catherine, and I wanted to uh, take a, a, a follow-up that came up where the question about um, kind of it's a, the thought, can you go back in time and can you scan for the heart bleed vulnerability in some way that would be historical. You know, if you have giant log files and you've got enough data that go back stored and you want to go back in time using something like our TLC and take a, take a, uh, have it set up especially to watch for um, the certain types of activities that are malicious, that's one thing. But in terms of the actual heart bleed itself, the communication uses standard um, standard SSL TLS uh, protocol. So there really isn't anything to catch. And true enough, a direct answer is, and it's true for most of us in this space, as of last week when the vulnerability became public was when the, the opportunity came for us to provide the tunings and the special details that help our customers set up for and watch for a scan to see if they have heart bleed in their environment. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Ed. Great. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, we had a couple of questions regarding uh, the Tripwire Secure Scan site. Uh, the URL, uh, somebody mentioned they had, had a, a problem uh, typing the URL. Uh, it is tripwire.com forward slash secure scan. And just make sure that we type in secure scan. Uh, the whole URL is, is lowercase, so, you know, S-E-C. U-R-E-S-C-A-N, and as I mentioned, we'll, we'll be sending out a, a, a link to that with our, the resources that we send out. All right, so we'll move on to the uh, next question in the, the Q&A. Bring back up my list here. I, I would like to take a question I see that's direct into the TE area. Someone asked if we have TE file uh, system COCA rules that help to detect heart bleed, and indeed we do. So if you go to our customer support portal, you can pull down that zip file and your readme and all the details that you need are in there. So that should be a help to you. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, another question. Does Heartbleed affect all old versions of OpenSSL or only a narrow band of versions in the 1.x range? And I'm going to pass this one over to Kent to address. Uh, to Kent to address. Yeah, it's only a small window. So uh, the bug was introduced a couple of years ago. So it was, um, I can't remember the specific range off the top of my head. I apologize. But, um, you know, uh, go to the heartbleed.com um, website and they'll show you the specific versions, but it is a range. Um, the latest uh, patch um, does not have that. Um, they've, they've fixed that. Um, so it's uh, safe to go ahead and update um, your systems. Great. Thanks, Ken. All right. So um, I'm going to jump in to say that there's, a, there's two or three comments going back and forth about whether or not we have a zero-day vulnerability or not. And the fact is that it's zero day to the industry, I suppose, because it really was an overlooked flaw in the code inside OpenSSL. However, and, and, and yes, it's been out there for, you know, some estimates were December 2011, right? 
So sure enough, it could be that people have known about it and have been using it to compromise websites for a number of years. That is in part why we're suggesting that you need sort of a bigger approach to this. It's not just a, a scan once, be done. And so I'll fold in a couple other answers. A person asked whether or not um, if they were to scan uh, their systems, what other kinds of evidence, you know, as we're using TE, for instance, what other evidence would we come across to indicate that heart bleed was there? Well, the fact is, at the point that you're looking, you will be past that, as Ken pointed out, the heart bleed issue occurs super early, and that you won't you won't really see changes in file systems or evidence of compromise until they've gotten into your system. They've already been making access to various systems around around. They're, they're going to be having uh, authorized credentials potentially. So it, it's not like there's a heart bleed bug in one spot or other that there's great evidence to. What there is, is there's many applications that have this vulnerability and our tools in combination can help you find those, fix them, and put yourself into a position to catch in case somebody has compromised over time. Great points, Catherine. Uh, another question that's coming in, um, I think this is kind of interesting. Um, you know, with Heartbleed being uh, affecting an open source tool. Question coming in from the audience: Are open source tools still safe? You know, for for enterprise system security. I think that's a great question. Ken, interested on your thoughts on that? Sure. Yeah. So you know, I don't really think it's a commercial versus open source uh, question here. Um, there's vulnerable software across the gamut. Um, you know, open source is is utilized everywhere. Um, you know, from Apache to MySQL. Um, you know, th there's insecure coding practices, um, be it commercial or open source. Um, what's actually the silver lining in all this is that it is bringing more attention to secure coding practices. Um, you know, we're seeing um, more awareness around this already. Um, but I would not say that because of this that open source is insecure. Um, you know, and I, I wouldn't say that, you know, commercial software is more secure than open source. Um, you know, there's, uh, again, it's, it's, um, it, it really isn't a question as to open source or commercial. Great. Thanks, Ken. Another question coming in, uh, if I scan and do not identify any open SSL on my network, am I covered from Heartbleed? This is an interesting question. This goes back to the distinction between, you know, local and remote checks, I think is, is the, the, the best way to look at this. Just because you do a basic remote scan um, or, you know, even an auth authenticated scan, um, there may be devices that come on and offline, so during that particular scan, the device may not have been on the network. Um, in terms of a, of a local check, the service, an affected service may or not have been running. It may have been an, uh, a VPN client, and maybe that VPN client's on a laptop and it was, you know, turned off or out on the road during that scan. So that, that's why it's important to do continuous scanning, um, always being on the lookout for those type of vulnerabilities, and then also looking for that suspicious activity on the network and then also looking for that uh, suspicious change or unauthorized change on the network that could be a result of someone exploiting that heart bleed vulnerability. So we'll move on through the list of, of questions. Should we be doing what should we be doing for our VPN users that work from home? Should each of these users set up and run SecureScan locally at home to check their router and workstation? That's definitely an option. So if, if you would like to distribute Tripwire SecureScan to your employees, have them sign up, um, have them take a look at the vulnerabilities, look at their routers, look at the devices in their network, that, that's an option. Um, another way to look at it, if you're a, in a larger organization, um, you may want to be able to combine all of those results into a central location. And we do offer here at Tripwire a add-on for our vulnerability management solution. It's called Pure Cloud Enterprise. Pure Cloud Enterprise is great for scanning those hard-to-reach locations. So if you have remote offices or home offices, uh, maybe you're going into a merger and acquisition, you need to do due diligence and scan your acquisition target but you don't want to deploy a bunch of hardware and software, you can use Pure Cloud Enterprise to, to scan 
those remote locations without having to set up any hardware or software. Uh, you know, also useful for, for partner networks. Um, if you're doing business with someone, they're vulnerable to Heartbleed, and you're letting them in on, the, on your network, you're introducing a risk there. That's another place that you can use uh, a cloud-based scanner uh, like Tripwire Pure Cloud Enterprise. So Ed, I'm going to jump in again. Um, there have been several uh, inquiries about their folks are going to their customer portal or they, they're trying to and they are not seeing the Heartbleed policies for TE or the COCA rules. And I can, you know, it'd just be not, it'd be a non-starter to try to guide you through that online at this point. But let me say this, our, our uh, customer support folks are standing by. They are totally aware that all this is up there and they could guide you. So do please call in. They'll take your call to help you out and get you everything you need. It would be a better action than trying to walk you through it here. So anyway, hopefully you're finding your way. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Catherine. I'll take the next question that, that's coming here. Uh, does SecureScan find other vulnerabilities other than Heartbleed? If so, does the tool recommend how to fix vulnerabilities that are found? Yes, tri Tripwire SecureScan um, detects over 60,000 different vulnerabilities. Uh, the Heartbleed vulnerabilities, uh, I believe the last count is uh, there's 16 variations that we detect. Uh, and our research team is continuing to investigate, and um, we actually just released more coverage for Heartbleed. But again, to answer your question, th this is not just about Heartbleed. There are literally tens of thousands of other vulnerabilities out there. And with Tripwire Secure Scan and with our flagship vulnerability management product, we have comprehensive checks. Again, those remote, those local checks help you find those vulnerabilities, uh, and then as well as provide remediation advice. So that's kind of the, the next step is once you've found the vulnerability, then what do you do? Oftentimes it's applying a patch, other mitigating steps. These tools also provide that information as well. Yeah, thanks, Ed. We had a comment come in along the way that, um, you know, in contrast to the Target and the Neiman Marcus vulnerabilities, isn't Heartbleed just a nosebleed, which I sort of thought was pretty funny, so I thought I'd share it with all of you. Um, the fact is that we don't know, and there, you know, our industry is notorious for not talking, and of course, uh, all the uh, hacker communities are very clear with one another, but we, we take our time. And you'll find most likely that the fallout from Heartbleed, what exposures may have occurred. I mean, we already know that in Canada they shut down their whole version of IRS, the IRS. They did arrest a guy, you know, and, and he was uh, in there playing around with using the Heartbleed vulnerability to, to make it, take action. So we know that there will be fines. How much financial damage, which was really the point of the, of the comment by, uh, by the listener, clearly Target is in, you know, estimates that I've seen could be upwards of billions, or a billion, I should say, um, and over. I would just comment that we won't know. We can't know right now. Over time, for sure, we'll, we'll get it figured out, but right now we don't. Good point. So I, I kind of want to chime in on that, too, is that, you know, this may not be a target, but this is another tool in the hacker's arsenal. Um, so when they actually do, maybe they find another vulnerability, you've secured your perimeter, you think your websites are safe, um, they may find another vulnerability and then utilize the OpenSSL um, exploit um, inside the network. So uh, when Ed was discussing how important it is to scan inside the network, um, that is um, just as important as scanning um, external URLs. Um, I think there's a sort of a false sense of confidence around, um, hey, I checked my website, we're safe. Um, you know, that's just the first step. Um, now you need to make sure that your in internal network is um, safe as well. Yeah, and we're seeing a comment that um, is a kind of a note of caution I thought I'd share with everyone that, you know, you might be an employee in a company or uh, you might think you can just go ahead and start a secure scan. But just be aware that it, you know, depending on where you are, it might be illegal to scan networks and resources that you don't own. And so if lines are leased or whatever you've got, you should think a little bit about talking to folks and you might knock some stuff over if you're not careful in terms of 
bandwidth and, and what your company does for a, its business. So just be careful. Um, possibly touch in with your IT team and, and so on. Now for home use, hey, go, go for it. Uh, another question that came in was around the routers. And, uh, you know, is it possible that my system has an embedded route or, or that systems with embedded router uh, code or maybe even such things as copiers and printers, you know? And, and clearly, if OpenSSL has been used in an embedded fashion, we wouldn't know you have to contact your vendor. And that's what's being advised across all this is that, it, you know, a lot of hardware, devices, other kind of systems out there, contact those vendors and see if there's a fix that's needed and that you should download, upgrade your firmware, or whatever they, they may advise. So there's a question that came in is, uh, does Tripwire Log Center work with your uh, vulnerability management product for integrated monitoring and reporting? Uh, yes, there's actually a, a very tight integration that we've um, already uh, deployed. Um, so um, we are able to bring in vulnerability information. Um, what's great about that is that you can then tie um, security events that are happening on various devices um, and then correlate that with actual vulnerabilities um, on that particular device. So um, it's really great in this particular case is being able to actually identify, hey, we think that um, this device is being exploited, um, and then we're able to go in and see, yes, it's, it is vulnerable to open SSL. Um, we need to get our security team on that. All right, another uh, question coming in. Uh, do the results of SecureScan stay local only, or are they transmitted back over the Internet? Is there an offline version of SecureScan? Uh, there is an offline version. Uh, it's not SecureScan. Uh, we do offer Tripwire IP360. That's our flagship vulnerability management product. Uh, it's a completely on-premise solution. All of the data stays inside your environment, doesn't go outside. Um, of your of your network, you're in complete control of that information and, and the security of that information. Uh, with Tripwire Secure Scan, the information is relayed back. Um, the, the, the scanning takes place from our secure data center. Uh, of course, you know we we use uh, top line encryption and uh, you know follow uh, you know standards in terms of auditing and making sure that that your data is protected. Um, however, you know a lot of organizations really prefer to have control over that data and they really want to keep it on site and, and we understand that, that that's kind of where um, our flagship vulnerability management product comes into play, Tripwire IP360. That, that uses a combination of hardware and virtual appliances, um, can scan very large disparate networks, scan the largest networks in the world. It's a, a tiered structure, um, but again, all of that information all of that security information, all the information about the posture of your network, that's all under your control with, with Tripwire IP360. And we have a question about does, um, it doesn't really specify which of the solutions we, we've offered today, do, does it op interoperate with other endpoint security, network security, and SIM solutions? And yes, there are a number of integrations that we have, and those are many of them posted on our site and other and other locations, and you can always call in and ask too. Uh, we have a couple of notable SIMs that we work with, and as well. So it's it's not um, we we definitely we're not a closed system. We've got a lot of points of integration. Question coming in on how does IP360 handle false positives? Can it confirm that the system device is vulnerable? Uh, I think this is a really interesting question because w I think what happens a lot of times in a vulnerability management workflow, you have a security operations team that's per performing the vulnerability scans. They generate this, you know, huge report, hand it off to the IT teams to remediate. Uh, sometimes IT teams or the system owners will come back and say, you know, hey, we're not vulnerable. You know, this machine's not vulnerable. I've already applied this patch. Uh, and there's a little bit of back and forth there. W what we do with Tripwire IP360, we actually show you the details of the check. So what that means is that both of you or, you know, the IT operations team or whoever can actually go in and verify our findings. Uh, most of the time what's happening is that there's some issue with patch supersession or, um, you know, where the wrong patch was applied, but it looks like it's the right patch. And there's really kind of a, a single source of, of truth that you can use by looking at that check in IP360 and then verify um, that it is indeed a vulnerability and not a false positive. 
So we're kind of getting down to the end of the session here. I think we've had a lot of good discussion, a lot of good questions coming in. Um, let's go ahead and we'll take one more question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, so we'll take this one as the last question. Not able to run Secure Scan on my external network. Is the free tool only for use on internal and private networks? Yeah, with, with Tripwire Secure Scan, what we wanted to do was provide vulnerability scanning for the internal network. There, you know, there are tools out there that can do those external, those perimeter scans. Um, we saw an opportunity to really help um, people with, with smaller networks secure the internal, their internal networks. And that's just with our free tool. We do also offer, as I've mentioned a few times, we have Tripwire IP360 that works in conjunction with our Pure Cloud Enterprise service. And with that Pure Cloud Enterprise service, you can use that to scan your perimeter networks. And the key here is all of this information can be consolidated, analyzed, automated. This is all going into the same spot so that you get a comprehensive view of your network, not just your internal network, not just your North American offices, but worldwide perimeter internal networks, single pane of glass. So we'll go ahead and wrap up the Q&A session, and I will hand things off back off to Kate. Thank you, Ed, and thank you to our three presenters today, Ken Wesson, Ed Smith, and Catherine Brocklehurst. And thanks to our audience for listening in and also for your participation. We had a lot of great questions and answered the polls and ratings, which brings up, um, we'd really like you to rate us before you head on with your day today. Um, and as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, I will be sending out a link to the on-demand version of this presentation, as well as a link to the slides, and also information about getting your CPE credit. So uh, once again, thank you all for joining. Thanks to our presenters, and have a great day.